Hi there, and welcome to the 22nd uh, Octoprint on Air broadcast live on this nice, well, more or less nice, I think it's raining, but still more or less nice uh, Saturday evening. Um, I'm your host, Gina Heuske, and uh, as usual, we'll just quickly take a short look at what I'll be talking to you uh, about today. I hope the sentence was grammatically at least halfway correct. Um, so uh, I'll tell you what I've been up to. Sorry for the traffic noise if you are hearing those. Apparently there are some people outside. Um, what I've been up to over the past week since the last broadcast, uh, what what, what uh, the next steps will be in my ongoing work on Octoprint. Um, then we'll have a quick look at the usage statistics that's actually a new segment uh, in this broadcast and uh, afterwards there will be the usual Q&A segment. So um, as always we'll have a live chat if you're on desktop uh, for those of you not watching the recording of this of course uh, which will be made available at a later date. Uh, there will be a live chat to the right on desktop and below on mobile and if you have any questions or want to add something to what I've said or anything just post it there. I'll try to keep an eye on it um, while I'm talking to you uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to answer any questions that come in in come up in there as well. Yeah. Also I'm stumbling over my tongue again apparently. Yeah. Um, Okay, so what I've been up to. I mentioned it the last time that, uh, yeah, a, a big chunk of the time since our last uh, broadcast, which I think I did on December 14th or something like that. I'm not entirely sure right now, but anyway, since then I've been on a, on a long overdue vacation or, or rather a staycation <laughs> more or less, but still... Um, uh, yeah, it, it was really overdue. I uh, did finish uh, two 1000 pieces uh, puzzles in that time, jigsaw puzzles, and hung them into my hallway with covers from Monkey Island 1 and 2. Really happy with that. Looks great. And I also spent some quality time with friends and family, played a ton of board games, uh, yeah, worked a bit through my uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime backlog and uh, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, in short, I, I I finally refreshed the batteries again after what what turned out to be a really 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 intense second half of 2018. So yeah, that was good, and really needed. And now I'm better. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So after I returned from that, uh, yeah, the first couple of days or even two weeks or so were first spent working through the backlog. Uh, from said vacation, so there was a ton of email to process, a ton of tickets to process, and a ton of the usual uh, forum uh, posts to to read and take a look if I needed to add something anywhere and all that. And uh, um, yeah, that was quite a ton of work, but thankfully I think I should have now more or less processed it all. Um, there are still some tickets left, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, and I. Also, while I worked through that stuff, I also yeah, processed a number of, of things already, fixed a couple of bugs on the maintenance branch, which will then be uh, delivered with 1.3.11. Um, took care of uh, various uh, small features re feature requests that I had on my plate for a long while now. And yeah, so there is a ton of stuff that I already did on the maintenance branch. The Actually, the biggest uh, chunk of work that was done though, um, or, or the one with the biggest impact in the future, I, I, I should rather say, is probably rather that, uh, yeah, so la just last week, I think even just the day before yesterday, so Thursday or even Friday, I think it was Thursday though, I uh, finally merged all the work uh, done by uh, various very awesome contributors to uh, support Python 3 in, in Octoprint, or rather to make Octoprint compatible to Python 3 as well as Python 2, so that 1.4.0 so what is currently the devil branch will uh, be able to run on, on both versions. Why is this important? I already mentioned it a couple of times. I don't know when, when was the last time, but I, I think I mentioned it. Um, so there are currently two major versions of Python out that are uh, supported. There's Python 2 and there's Python 3. Python 2 is old and about to go end of life in uh, 2020. So on, I think actually on January 1st. 
Uh, Python 3 has been out for quite some time now. The problem with Python 3, though, is that in, in, in there are parts which are backwards incompatible to Python 2. So getting something to run under both means you have to find a way around this backwards incompatibilities and make sure stuff uh, works on both. Um, and especially something like a larger legacy code base that you developed against Python 2 is something that is a ton of work to port to Python 3 even more work to port to Python 2 and 3 so that it can run concurrently. I don't, you don't have to maintain two versions, which is completely out of the question for me. And um, yeah, so this is uh, thankfully work that a lot of people which are a bit more yeah um, comfortable with Python 3 already than me, who spent most of her time with Python 2 the past couple of years, um, did. And uh, there were a ton of pull requests and I felt uh, worse and worse not being able to look into them properly and merge them and, and all that. And uh, simply due to time constraints with, with uh, while 1.3.10 was still brewing and uh, being made ready and all that. But now that that was all out of the way and also uh, one of the contributors, Murphix, uh, took a ton of uh, time and um, yeah, basically merged all the open pull requests into one <laughs> that I could review on block. Um, and then uh, fix here and there, do add some more fixes here and there. And so, uh, yeah, that finally made it possible to merge all that stuff. And now I'm fairly happy, happy to say that I was able to print, um, uh, yeah, some stuff on, on uh, Octoprint 1.4.0 on the development version, uh, both under Python 2 and Python 3. So same code base running on both, driving a printer the same uh, way. And, and yeah, that was really, a huge load off my shoulders that this is finally done. Um, so um, the current plan is that uh, Python 2 and Python 3 will both be supported for 1.4.0 when that comes out. No, I don't have no, I do not yet have um, uh, yeah, a date for that. Um, and that uh, while this version is out, we will flag um, uh, flag plugins in the plugin repository uh, with which Python versions they support. So basically, right now they already have this metadata attached, which uh, tells Octoprint when it fetches the data from the plugin repository uh, whether it runs on, on, on only on Linux or uh, on which Octoprint version it needs, and we'll just add a flag for that um, for which Python version it needs. And I guess uh, at first, most of the plugins will still require Python 2 due to the backwards incompatibilities I mentioned, but I hope that over the lifetime of 1.4.0, most of those that are really commonly used will also be yeah, um, ported over to Py3 or, or be able to run under both. And then, um, yeah, the next step after 1.4.0 will have to be 2.0.0 actually, because uh, that is when we'll be dropping Python 2 support on Octoprint and we'll go all in with Python 3, which also opens up some really, really nice possibilities with regards to programming language features, which uh, right now I cannot utilize. Async IO and uh, type, on the type annotations and all that. So that's really nice and I'm really looking forward to that, but that's still a long way off. Um, yeah, but, but since this will basically mean, uh, yeah, basically make Octoprint backwards incompatible um, to any plugins that are not yet <laughs> able to run under Python 3, uh, uh, yeah, it, it will mean a, a major version bump, so 2.0 instead of 1.5.0, but that's okay. I mean, that's how things go. Um, in any case, this is something within the time frame of more than a year, definitely more than a year. Um, so I, I guess we'll just have to, uh, yeah, have to support Python 2 in Octoprint a bit longer than Python 2 is officially supported by Python. But uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's just the way things are now. Um, yeah, during this transition period, the challenges that I'm now looking at and I'm still thinking about how best to approach will actually be to maintain Octoprint for both versions. Um, with, uh, without having to constantly uh, toggle back and forth between the two uh, versions. But uh, uh, yeah, we've already uh, ramped up some, some more tests and uh, test uh, um, unit tests and all that so that this will hopefully be possible to automate more or less. 
And what I'm certainly not looking forward to is until 1.4.0 is released, merging up any changes that I do on the maintenance branch uh, for 1.3x, uh, because yeah, then I also always have to make sure that with the merge, I do not break Python 3 compatibility again. But yeah, well, um, this is also the way it is. Anyhow, um, yeah, so once 1.4.0 uh, lands in, in, in RC, in, in release candidate phase. And as I already mentioned, no, I do not have a time uh, line for that yet. But when it happens, then I can assure you that we will need a ton of testers, ideally under both, ide ideally running both Python versions. So a ton of testers under Python 2 and also a ton of testers under Python 3. Um, so that we can make sure that there are no regressions or anything. So this will be a bit of a larger release compared to, let's say, the, 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 um, the migration from 1.2.0 to 1.3.0 actually in that regard because yeah it's it's a quite invasive change making that stuff compatible to python 3 so uh, i really hope that when we get to that point a lot of you will um yeah will will start running the rc candidate and hopefully help iron out anything yeah um so um and finally if you want to run or need for whatever reason, to run uh, Octoprint right now under Python 3. Here's your chance. You can now do this. You just have to check out the Devil branch. How to do this is explained in the FAQ. And um, if you do try that, though, then please, anything that you find, anything that looks funny, any, anything that does not behave and outright uh, shows buggy behavior, please report it back because the earlier you find that stuff, the earlier it can be ironed out and uh, hopefully also be used to learn from that so that it doesn't return or something like this yeah so that was one thing and the other thing that is uh that that uh the other bigger thing that um i spent some time with the last weeks since my return from vacation is um yeah so just before uh going uh, yeah, just before by pretty much wrapping up the year 2018, I got an email from uh, Discourse. So uh, those of you who do not know, um, the community forum from Octoprint is hosted by, is, is a Discourse instance. And this Discourse instance so far was hosted by the nice people at Discourse itself um, under their open source uh, program, um, which basically gives you a free standard instance for your open source project. And uh, well, this free standard instance has certain limits and we've outgrown those. So the community is flourishing and uh, bigger than ever. And there are a ton of people using it and it really makes me happy. But it also has the downside that, that we now need to um, either pay a ton of mo money for uh, for the next level of, of, of hosting or what I have decided on doing instead is um, yeah go self-hosted because that is cheaper and something that uh, is, is way more affordable in that case. And um, that will also uh, down the road hope, uh, will allow us more customization should that be necessary. And um, yeah, will also allow us to install some uh, plugins that I have high hopes for making my life and your lives easier. <laughs> so yeah, in any case, uh, a really, really huge thanks to uh, Jubileth and Can't Live Long for um, volunteering as sysadmins. Uh, for this uh, self-hosted forum install, because honestly, um, I don't know how I should have, could have managed to do that on top of everything else. So this uh, that they now are taking care of this, uh, of course, in coordination with me and all that um, really uh, lifts a huge load off my shoulder. So thank you. Um, OK, so uh, what are the next steps? I already talked about the very next step, basically, which is the forum move, which will actually take care uh, take place on this uh, coming Monday, uh, February 11th. Um, uh, hopefully, if everything goes wrong, uh, right? Oh God. <laughs> um, so plan is uh, to get everything over with within the day, and uh, from how I understand the necessary steps and all that, uh, that should actually hopefully work out fine. Uh, we've done all the preparation that needs to be done. And now it's just doing the final step and uh, yeah, moving all the data from one instance to the next and then um, redirecting uh, 
all of you to the new instance and hoping that everything runs as smoothly as it did before. So hopefully you won't even notice much other than a bit of downtime. Uh, please keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and once that is over with, uh, of course, more development work. So on the one hand, of course, more work on 1.3.11. Um, I still have some tickets open from my vacation uh, that I want to take a closer look at. Uh, some of them are feature requests. Some of them are possible bugs that I still take, uh, still want to analyze. Some of you are still not providing logs. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I hope to get the first release candidate for 1.3.11 out uh, yeah, in a month or so, but I don't want to make any promises right now because, yeah, um, you know, the usual stuff, uh, as soon as you say a date, people will nail you down on that date and then, I don't know, something horrible happens and suddenly you can't hold that date and then people get angry. So, no, we don't want that. So, I hope a month, but I don't know and I'm not making any promises. Also, what I need or really want to do and really need to do is, and this is also something that I realized over the past two weeks or one and a half weeks or so of, of finally um, yeah, looking closer at those uh, those PRs to merge for, for Python 3 support, is that I really need to get back, back to working on 140. So uh, the past three or six months or so, I, I'm not actually, not actually sure when it started, but um, I was so wrapped up with anything that was maintenance and giving support to people on the forum and answering email questions and I don't know what and mostly just yeah trying to 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 run after everything that was opened in ticket form on github and and trying to make everyone happy that I I really did not get around to working on the next huge version anymore and this is not how this huge next version is going to I mean it's not like it's going to code itself so um I really was not happy with this progress and I want to change that now. And uh, yeah, I guess if uh, the maintenance and the support overhead don't get less on their own and just keeps on increasing and never, never decreasing again, which is what I've observed over the past year or so, then I guess it's just time to draw a line and say, well, too bad. I really 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 only dedicate that and that much time i already tried that a year ago with a timetable and then life happened and i did not not uh, stick to this timetable anymore and i want to change that again and also take a look maybe if i need to change the um, yeah the ratios of how much time i spend on maintenance how much time i spend on development and all that but in any case i really need to get back on track with this and um yeah Otherwise, there is simply no room left for development work and this will not make people happy long term. I mean, short term, of course, bugs are fixed and uh, small annoyances are fixed and there is a release every two months and all that or every two and a half months. And I'm present on the forums and answering questions and all that. But I think we should more focus on the long term now. And that means for me to, yeah, as, as much as it... Uh, as, as I struggle with that, I have to dial back a bit and, um, yeah, basically let the community more room to help themselves and uh, also maybe help fixing bugs by uh, pull requests and all that and not uh, rely on me doing everything. So in any case, what that means is please be patient <laughs> uh, in the future a bit more. Uh, if, if you really, really need input from me in any kind of way, uh, I, I promise I try to get around to it, but it will take longer because I will, will focus more on development again. And uh, I think this is the right approach to tackling the big tasks that are ahead of us. And the Python 3 one was only a small thing. I still have the com layer rewrite to do. And long term, we also need a UUI because the, the current one is really dated and uh, not as flexible as I like uh, it to uh, like it to be and all that. And yeah, that stuff is not something that I can do, I don't know, one hour a week or so. So consequences. <laughs> okay. Oh, and finally, um, with regards to next steps, I have not forgotten uh, what I promised last uh, broadcast that I want to make the tracking results public, publicly available from the anonymous usage tracking that is now in 1.3.10 uh, in future versions. Um, I looked into this right after my vacation, thinking that it would probably just be set a secondary Grafana instance up, have a cron job that pushes uh, snapshots over there and make that publicly available and everyone is happy. 
And right way, uh, halfway through that, I turned out uh, apparently, well, um, no, uh, automatic snapshot creation through a cron job is not as easy to do as I thought, because this only can work in a full-blown browser session, which is needed in order to get access to the data. So that is apparently an architectural constraint in Grafana. And um, there are also some tickets about this uh, all over the net. And apparently they want to change that long way, long term, but I guess they have their hands full equally as much as me. So um, currently it's not in there yet. And that means I need to find another solution. And I've already looked a bit at, uh, at other options. So what's looking good is just um, using some kind of headless Chrome instance. Uh, via something like, I don't know, Puppeteer or so, which apparently is an, in, in a Node.js binding for this, which is fairly easy to use as far as I saw. And then use that to export the data into a snapshot and then push that snapshot to another instance. So this is something that I want to look into now. But as I said earlier, hands full and all that might take a while, which is also why um, uh, why I added this new uh, segment here uh, about the, a quick look at the stats. Um, if uh, you really want to get access to the data as fast as possible and can't wait for it, then please help me. Uh, yeah, help is certainly welcome. And um, yeah, as I said, until I have that stuff up, we'll just do a regular look at the stats um, in these broadcasts here. And speaking of which, let's just get over to this uh, now, and I just have to quickly switch you over to the right screen. There you go. So, um, this is, uh, these are, uh, this is the, the, yeah, basically the overview of the last 30 days. And as you can see, uh, I don't know if you remember how it looked the last time where we basically had something that went this way. It's now a more flat, yeah, a more flattened out, uh, View, but it's still rising, still increasing. We're currently at uh, 39,600 insta instances see seen over the past 30 days, which yeah is um, a number about four times as high as I thought it would be, and is um, yeah seriously surprising me a bit. But hey, okay, um, you see a rough um, um, location uh, distribution. Here, we can also zoom in a bit to make this a bit more um, usable. So yeah, pretty pretty dense around the US and Europe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this, this is stuff that really excites me because it I said it last time, I think already that um, I really love how it is used all over the world. The little thing there, which I which I coded together six years ago, just to solve a, a personal problem of mine. So I certainly did not expect this in my life. Yeah. Um, so the last thirty days, all of you uh, who are who have tracking enabled, uh, printed around one hundred and eighty-two years. That's quite long. And as I also expected when I set this up, uh, the the weekends, which are those two days here, always between the two black bars are usually the the days of the week with the strongest or with the highest amount of printed uh, hours uh, not not printed hours sorry uh, that's another which i was about to show you with um, 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 uh, online instances um these are the printed hours and you also see the same peaks here so this is a weekend this is a weekend this is a weekend this is the weekend and this is not a weekend this is unusual so this is a bit of an outlier here okay um, some of you are still running the RCs. Uh, sorry, some of you are still running the RCs, but at least it's yeah way less than 100 now, so that's good. Um, and yeah, so let's take a look at the printed hours, uh, print job uh, statistics and printed hours. And so, so, so you see also the print events per day, basically how many prints were started per day, how many f uh, finished successfully is the yellow line. How many were cancelled, which is the blue line, and how many ran into some kind of error from the firmware or on the serial line, which is the orange line. Um, then you have, uh, yeah, how many hours were printed per octoprint instance, which is a bit uniform. <clears throat> um, then here you see what I wanted to show you earlier. Um, yeah, most prints are actually started on the weekends, 
Most prints also finish on the weekends, though a bit later in the day. So we have a bit of a time shift going here. Um, and yeah, we still see that roughly 40% of all prints that are started get cancelled, which I found funny. The first time that I mentioned it and I still find it funny. I can't help myself. <laughs> Yeah, so 25% um, of all prints are uh, under 33 minutes in length. The longest was 1,443 hours. Okay, uh, convert this into days if you want. I'm not able to do that right now from the top of my head. Yeah, and 99% are under 21 hours. So um, that's also some, uh, interesting. You also see this a bit in a graphical representation here. So, yeah. Most of you print or, or half you print less than or, or half of all print jobs are less than one and a half hours. So, yeah, I found this quite interesting. And 4% uh, of, uh, of all prints were SD card prints, so not, not streamed to your printer, but printed on your directly by your printer from its SD card and only yeah, monitored through Octoprint. It's also funny to see that for once. And um, this is something that I uh, will roll out with 13L11, which is that the um, the, uh, the usage tracking plugin will also track when your firmware sends an error and if so, what kind of error. So apparently for some reason, printer halt kill call was um, happened nine times over the course of the last 30 days. However, uh, whatever that re the reason for that was. So um, environment is also maybe somewhat interesting. Ah, uh, takes a while because there is a ton of data for 30 days. <laughs> um, yeah, most of you are running four core processors, then 1200 hertz or 1400 hertz frequency, uh, kilohertz, sorry. Um, most used operating system is Linux, no surprises there. Uh, Python version, PIP version, you see all of, all of those are 2.7. Um, I think I limited those to the top 10, though, if I was to expand that, you would probably see the test runs on one three uh, on, 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 on 140 uh, with with Python uh, 3.7. Um, the most common um, Raspberry Pi model uh, is actually the Pi 3, followed closely by the Pi 3 Plus. And there are at least 2000 instances running on a Pi 0 W, which I really, really cannot recommend and uh, really ca cannot recommend at all, but whatever floats your boat. Um, Octopi version, notable firmware groups. This is maybe interesting to some of you. So Marlin, uh, yeah, is, is really the top dog here with 77%. The Prusa Marlin fork is another 11% and Repetive with 4%. Bit of Smoothieware, bit of Clipper, Redeem, Rapper firmware Selfish Malian and ANET A8. Stock firmware, which does not have any safety protection at all, thermal, uh, thermal runaway protection at all, and you really should not be running that. So 751 of you over the past 30 days hopefully heeded the warning and immediately fetched the printer and uh, will not show up in this count again. At least that's my hope. Um, yeah, and just to be... Um, just to track that in the future a bit. Um, this is also something that I added for 1.3.11. Uh, the, uh, there we will also get uh, how many unsafe firmware warnings are triggered and w with what printer. So that might also help to figure out if the warning needs to be a bit more obnoxious. Um, something that I think I showed you the last time is also the throttling statistics. And uh, yeah, that we are still, as you can see, there there are still quite a lot of pies out there with that are running with insufficient power supplies. So I mean, we are seeing roughly, and on the weekends there are more of those, um, still around 2.5k uh, peak uh, of of current under voltage situations, and even 3k uh, ever since boot up. So. People, please check your power supplies. If there is a little flashing lightning bolt uh, since you updated to 1.3.10 in your Octoprint uh, navbar, heed that warning. You need to check your power supply. Under voltage and also overheating are causing severe issues on Raspberry Pis that lead to really, really tricky to debug problems, print failures and all that. So yeah, as you can see, there is definitely a problem out there 
with a small but significant percentage having the, uh, running into these issues. So um, yeah, anyhow, that is the current view. Uh, one thing that I wanted to show you is something that I observed during the holidays. So this is um, a snapshot of the print job pane uh, dashboard thingy from uh, December 20th until January the 9th. And I found it really, really funny. I was observing that over the holidays, actually, every other uh, day or so. And I, 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 I found it cute how it dipped on December 25th. So way outside of, of the usual level uh, for prints during the week. And there was also a slight peak on December 23rd. And then it did this dip where people were spending their time with their families and all that. And then it came back up. And then apparently there needed to be done some compensation for the for the holiday, for, for the overall, overall holiday dip. And a, a ton of printing happened right on the first uh, weekend after New Year's. So, yeah, I chuckled a bit when I observed that. Anyhow, that's what I wanted to show you. And now that we have had this quick look at this, yeah, you can also see that here, by the way, of course. You see how, how light the color here is with the print starts compared to a normal weekday we saw earlier. And uh, yeah, that was December 25th. Enjoy. I hope all of you enjoyed your holidays. Um, okay, so that was a quick look at the stats, which means we will now switch over one tab to the right because it's no time for the Q&A segment. And I also wanted to do this so that you can also see me again. Um, OK, so um, I need focus in this window. Hooray. Uh, first question by Chris H. Um, actually fits quite nicely to the stuff we just took a look at, which is uh, I'd love to hear more about how you're getting the metrics and passing them to Elasticsearch, but that's probably something that would be of interest to the general Octoprint community. So honestly, I do not care if this is of interest to the <laughs> general Octoprint community. Um, uh, and there weren't that many questions for today to begin with. So let's just uh, take a quick look at how this so nothing too in deep but still uh, first of all some background on on how this tracking and how these how these visualizations that you just saw actually happen you you see the keyword there elastic search uh, some of you might not be familiar with this or probably most of you won't be familiar with this this is basically yeah some kind of big data search engine kind of thing um, which you can feed data into from various points and in case of octoprint I do that uh, with the tracking data and um, a tracking data arrives on a server of mine, um, gets uh, gets uh, um, yeah in in form of a, of, a, of an of an HTTP request against a, a run of the mill web server engines and engine X in that file in in that file that was German sorry <laughs> in this case um, and um, uh, yeah and that and that. Nginx endpoint logs it to a, a speci special uh, log file and that log file and, and then again gets parsed by Logstash, which is also part of the so-called ELK stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana and uh, Kibana and uh, Logstash then parses the, the, the lines in the log file and turns them into stuff that it can directly feed into Elasticsearch. And uh, we'll now just quickly take a slightly closer look at how that looks like. So. Basically, this would be uh, a request that a tracking plugin sends. Uh, it's a simple GET request. And in this GET request, there is the, the unique ID associated with the Octoprint instance. In this case, this is the one of my development machine. And uh, yeah, the event, the tracking event, in this case, it was uh, yeah starting up the Octoprint instance. Um, and then a bunch of uh, query parameters attached to that, uh, which encode further payload data that depends on the event in question. So, and so this gets sent by the uh, anonymous usage tracking plugin in inside Octoprint, if you have enabled it, if not, then not, um, to the, the tracking server tracking.octoprint.org. So, and there it uh, gets uh, processed by Nginx and turned into a log line that looks roughly like this. So, uh, a, an IP address, Timestamp, again, the request with all the payload data, the user agent, in this case, a custom user agent, which encodes uh, Octoprint and its version again. 
so this is basically one of such, uh, one one of the lines that that are then in the log file. So and uh, then logstash happens, and logstash basically turns this into a whole data point that contains all this information. So it extracts the timestamp, the UID, the event that got tracked, the Octopen version from the user agent, and some variety of that. So what it also does is, so this is the full version, but it also limits it to this bit and also to this bit so so that I can uh, yeah run queries based on only the base version, in that case 1.3.11 or 1.3.11 one, RC1 or 1.3.10 RC2 or something like that, but also on the full version with git commit and everything. Uh, then comes all the payload data. Uh, data from the request, so uh, the version is in there again, and I can't remember right now why I did that. The Python version, the pip version, how much RAM, how many cores, what frequency, the operating system, and what also is done in at that stage is that the IP address that we saw in the log, <clears throat> so here, uh, what I encoded here is AABBCCDD, um, gets uh, turned into a very rough uh, geographical location, which is used for generating that map, for ex example, and then thrown away. So I do not have interest in your IP address. I only have interest in where roughly in the world you are, and I don't know. I do not even want to know where your house is. I really just want to basically know roughly where in the world. So with within 200, 500, whatever kilometers is fine, just roughly. So and this is what happens there. Yeah, and then. Uh, all that stuff uh, lands in Elasticsearch and I can run queries on that and those queries then allow me to uh, create stuff like this. So um, this is querying for the number of unique instances over each hour, over each day, for example. This counts all of them, this counts all of the payload.elapse data on print done events over the past 30 days and sums it up and, and yeah, so this is basically how all this comes together from those from those simple uh, tracking requests that we just saw. And um, yeah, um, what also happens in the background is that every day I have a cron shop that runs Curator, which is a little tool that uh, regularly can perform specific cleanup actions on your Elasticsearch cluster. And in that case, it deletes anything that's older than 90 days because I do not keep the data longer than 90 days. I do not want the raw data for more than 90 days. Um, I uh, So, th so th that is taken care of that way. So um, those of you a bit more familiar in HTTP uh, will already have noticed that this approach has a, has a slight disadvantage because uh, the request length in GET requests with, with all this, this uh, um, payload data attached to it and encoded in, in form of uh, yeah, request parameters. Um, yeah, that length that this line can have is limited. And uh, currently, this is, this is the reason why currently I do not uh, do something like also lock what um, what plugins you have installed and in what versions, for example, on startup, which I know a ton of plugin developers are very interested in and which they already have asked me about and which I com completely understand. I mean, it's the same reason why I want to know how many Octoprint instances are there and, and what kind of stuff they are running on and so. So, yeah, this is something that I'm looking into by um, yeah turning that get into a post request and logging the body and uh, coding all the data into the body and then dumping that in the log. But yeah, slow. Uh, slow progress on that because while there are a ton of uh, search results related to how to lock or how to get nginx to lock uh, request bodies to the access lock most of them do not work at least for current versions and uh, those that do work are a bit mm -hmm. so yeah i'm still looking into that i do not know if i will be able to push it into 1311 but it's definitely it's definitely something that i want to look into yeah um okay so i hope this was quick enough but still interesting <laughs> okay um then the next question by rigid 3d is there any plan on developing a wi-fi wi setup plugin such as netconnect d um for those of you who do not know uh, netconnect d that is actually something that i wrote about 
Well, it's over four years now, I think. That was one of the first things that I did when I was still with BQ. Um, uh, and that basically was a little demon that sat on something like, a, like your Octopi instance and um, uh, yeah, try to figure out. That was back before the Pies came with Wi-Fi on board. So, so when you still had to put a Wi-Fi dongle, a Wi-Fi dongle on it. And then uh, this little demon then tried to fire up an access point based on um, based on uh, yeah if, if that was possible with the hardware in question and if, if 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 it wasn't otherwise connected to the network and in that case then uh, also allowed you to access Octoprint um, by connecting to this access point and configure your Wi-Fi connection via that so why did this never make it into Octopi um, the problem was that um, as I said back then uh, the Wi-Fi, uh, the, the, the Pies did not have a Wi-Fi chipset on board and um, the dongles were very hit and miss with regards to access point support. So that just didn't work out. And by the time that changed and the Pies did have a, a network, a, a Wi-Fi on board and all that, um, yeah, stuff in the underlying operating system changed enough that it actually would need a rewrite by now in order to uh, work properly. And so, as I mentioned, I do not have time uh, to to take care of, of of a ton of stuff that I wish I did, <laughs> uh, and and I, there's also the reason why a couple I think two years or so ago I actually added a note to the readme of NetConnectD that it's not longer supported by me because when should I do that on top of things? And so yeah, so this is why this never saw the 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 yeah the light of the sun uh, more or less. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've also already hinted at uh, at it. I also do not see myself looking into something like that. So I do not know if other people are working on that. I think guy uh, um, guy stuff. I was just about to say guy brush. I, too much monkey island. Um, uh, Guysoft is looking into it. Uh, so Guy Sheffer from from Octopi uh, or wanted to look into it or, or wanted. Or at least mentioned something like this. I I can't remember right now, to be honest. Um, but um, I can promise you that it will probably not be me who looks into it because I simply have my hands way too full with the regular Octoprint development. And yeah, I'm sorry to say, but I I just don't see that happening. So I I have to face that I can't solve everything, I guess. And uh, yeah, this is definitely something that others will have to look into. Um, okay, next question by Alex. What's your, uh, what's your opinion on the feasibility of interfacing ESP 3D with Octoprint? As 3D printers cost quality ratio continues to improve, a Raspberry Pi with accessories, PSU housing and so on, to add to the printer becomes more and more a considerable cost for print farms. I see a potential solution to this by having Octoprint run in some centralized location, cloud, Docker and so on and installing cheap ESP32s in our 3D printers. They could then wirelessly interface with Octoprint. So first of all, what is ESP3D and what is ESP32? Uh, ESP3D, I looked it up, is, um, he also uh, kindly provided a link, um, is a small firmware that you put on an ESP32, which is a very, very, very cheap Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller. Um, do I have one here? I certainly do, but I, can't quickly find it now. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and that software, uh, that firmware runs on that thing, and then, uh, as far as I understood it, basically exposes the serial interface of a three B three D printer as a TCP socket. If that is indeed the case, <laughs> and it does it like this, um, then um, yeah, just. Um, Using that socket uh, from from an existing Octoprint install, be that on a Pi or be that on some on, on a NAS in running in a Docker container or wherever, would actually be quite straightforward already, I think, because I think it would be possible to just uh, use the Com Factory uh, plug-in hook to basically replace the serial um, connection that is made today with a socket connection. And uh, one thing that I've already added in the Com rewrite. Uh, and which I also tested and was working for 140 is uh, socket uh, is socket support so that you not necessarily have to connect to a serial connection but you can also connect to a raw TCP socket. Um, so that would possible there as well. Uh, and 
as I said, also possible in one three if if someone sat down and tried their hand at one of such plugins. I, I mean, I know that the um, the GPX plugin, which uh, which you need in order to um, connect to um, FlashForge and um, MakerPod printers from Octoprint, that all also um, wraps the serial port and uh, replaces it with its own implementation. So that would basically be. Uh, Sorry, there was a question. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Brian asked. Uh, I'm sorry. The what plugin would enable connecting of a socket? Uh, the there is uh, there is a plugin hook. So a, a hook that that uh, third party plugins or or also first party plugins in Octoprint can implement in order to replace the 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 com uh, the the sorry the serial port. So what Octoprint by default does is it creates a serial port object and, uh, and, and, and uses that to connect to a regular serial connection and communicate to your printer via that. But there is also the com factory um, hook. I think it was something like octoprint.com.factory.serial or something like that it was called. And that allows you to overwrite how the serial object that is used to talk, uh, uh, that Octoprint uses to talk to your printer is, is created. And if you implement some regular um, methods, so read line, write, uh, I think it also needs some properties that it needs to be able to read, but uh, that should be documented. Um, then you can yeah, basically just shove something to Octoprint to use as a serial port that is not actually a serial port, but which also just as well could be a TCP, for P TCP socket or I don't know, something else entirely. So. The only th the only one that I so far know using that is the GPX plugin because it uses that to um, to wrap the serial socket with the GPX library in order to communicate to the Sailfish uh, firmware uh, firmware stuff. But I'm not aware of uh, any others that use it, but it is possible. So and it's documented. So uh, if anyone wants to play around with that, I would certainly be interested in hearing about the results. Uh, and we would also be happy to give an update on that in the next broadcast. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, in general, so um, if it works like that and you want to do that, then yes, just having Octoprint run on some centralized location and communicating to your printer via uh, TCP through Wi-Fi would also be my approach. I have to admit, though, that I would be a bit, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've seen Wi-Fi go down on occasion and I, I can't help myself. I do not trust anything wireless for hour or day long print jobs, but that's just me. So if you want to do that, do that. Um, personally, I would probably rather put one of those cheap um, uh, ENC something or other Ethernet adaptive thingies. I also have one of those here somewhere, but I also do not know right where exactly right now. I have this, I have a big shelf unit thingy right here on my right, and a ton of uh, yeah, a ton of little boxes with uh, electronic components, and and the labels on them are a bit too generic, as I just noted. But well, okay. So anyway, there is this this uh, also fairly cheap. Um, serial enabled Ethernet controller thingy called ENC. I really have forgotten the model number. Um, and as far as I understand, you can in theory interface it with something like an ESP um, or any other microcontroller, an Arduino or something like that. And then in theory might be able to also add Ethernet to any serial enabled printer if it doesn't even have already, uh, it doesn't even have Ethernet already, like a ton of the 32 bit boards out there do. So maybe this is also just a question of time. And this is something that I would actually rather prefer personally, because I really, really trust, um, trust Ethernet uh, direct cable connection stuff way more than uh, a wireless kind of anything. But as I said, that's just me. Yeah. Okay. So I hope this answers the question. So in theory, pro uh, probably already possible. Even though, even more though, once I finally get around to working on the development of, no? um, and uh, interesting project by the way. I wasn't aware of that. And I, yeah, if I had the time, I would probably now look into playing around with that. But I sadly have to 
if I do that, it's probably more something that I do in my spare time than in my work hours because, yeah, I can't justify it, that, uh, sadly. Anyhow, next question by Alexander Svensson. Um, I work in Python a lot. Even so, I find the documentation for building my own plugins fairly daunting. What would you recommend? Thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, if you haven't already uh, done that, then uh, best first of all run through the plugin tutorial to get the other basics nailed down. It's a bit, it's it's not the first thing in the whole documentation, but it's in there and um, it's something uh, that should at least help you to understand. Yeah, the basics, bits and pieces, and how you how you have to structure your 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 package and all that in order to get Octoprint to even recognize stuff as your first uh, as your plugin and also front end and back end components and how they interact and all that. Um, and after you've done that, I would suggest to find a plugin that does roughly this uh, roughly something that is similar to what you wanted to achieve, and then take a take a look at its source code and uh, figure out how it's done, and copy and adapt basically. And then, once you are a bit more fluent with plugin development, then please, 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 please help me improve the documentation. Because I have to admit that I'm personally also not 100% happy with the state currently. Um, I uh, yeah, there's this tutorial that I spent roughly whew, two weeks, three weeks or more on writing, um, and. Yeah, as you as you hear that that is a ton of time to spend exclusively on writing documentation, and um, it does it does walk you through the basics, and 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 then there is also the other parts of the documentation that are a bit more um, developer centric already, less hand holding, more here's the information, do what if, do with it what you please about uh, what mixins are available, what hooks are available, and all that. Um, yeah, but the middle ground between is basically missing. So uh, I would love to see something like uh, an advanced tutorial, something like cookbooks, maybe like I want I, I want to have a button in my UI that triggers whatnot in the back end, uh, things like this. So basically more advanced, more tutorials with more advanced uh, things that a lot of people struggle with. I also see this every day on the forums, not every day, but often on the forums and <coughs> sorry. And um, yeah, so this is something that I really would, would love to have. And speaking of documentation in general, I really would also love to have a proper end user documentation that shows people the first steps, the really first steps in using Octoprint and how to do that and all that. But I simply do not see myself being able to put aside the time needed to write it. Plus, in case of an end user documentation, I'm also not entirely sure if I'm the right person to do it because I'm really in way too deep by now. Um, so yeah, in that regard, I really would love to see some initiative from the community um, to improve the documentation uh, regarding both plugin development and user documentation. And I will do everything that I can in the time that I can put aside for it to help there. But um, yeah, it it would be really great if 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 we could move this forward without me having to do it because yeah, you know, all the balls in the air and I have to juggle them all and. Gray hair and all that, not good. Yeah, okay. Um, and that was actually the last question in the backlog. And I'll just take a quick look into the live chat if there was anything that I missed. I'm not the only one apparently that's a bit paranoid when it comes to wireless <laughs> connections being stable enough for a long print. John uh, has the same problem and uh, great Alex uh, might look into uh, the ESP question that is that is awesome news I'm really looking forward to any results there okay but no questions so no live questions back to myself boom okay um yeah so um that's pretty much it for this installment I think uh, the next one I will do in roughly a month again. Uh, as usual, I will post the, envi uh, the, the environment. Ay, ay, ay. The, the appointment uh, on Patreon. Um, I will also put the recording of this one up sometime next week, I hope. Uh, I just need to cut it and uh, uh, and, and, and make the, the chapter marks, basically. This is always a bit of a bit of annoying, annoying busy work. <laughs> But yeah, I'll, I'll get around to it. And um, yeah, 
in any uh, in any case uh, thank you all uh, for for being here who attended this live and i hope it was interesting and uh, you learned something or at least um yeah had fun <laughs> and uh, i hope to see you again in well roughly a month and until then all that is left to say is happy printing bye